My journey in learning coding and computer science was from the bottom to the top. What this means is that I started with learning programming languages that were low level like C++ and assembly, and eventually worked my way up to higher level languages like Python. <laughs> And Java. If I were to recommend a language to start with for a beginner, it would be the complete opposite. Start with a higher level language like Python first, because they provide abstractions from complexity like memory management and other not fun things that you should not have to concern yourself with when starting out. If you went back in time and told me the kid running Hello World in a terminal, that I was going to code things from virtual reality and augmented reality experiences. Summon Sid. To full stack websites and distributed systems, I would not have believed you. Let's go through those four years in five minutes, starting now. A variable is just storage for some piece of data that you as the programmer create. In this case, we have the number 20, which is an integer. A function is just a way for you as a human to organize your code into bite-sized pieces. If I have a bunch of code in one area called main, well, that's just messy. I can split that guy up into two different functions called function one and function two. And now you can just call those two functions from main instead. There are also loops which let you execute statements in your program many times. This objects and object pointers, the statements in your program. And we won't have time to get to all of that. My first year learning coding was building really simple terminal applications with these basic principles. At this point, as a beginner, you look at real apps like games or websites and think, wow, I could never build anything like that. I remember having that feeling and we're going to see how and when that completely changed. Yeah, honestly, I hate assembly and we're skipping this section because this was the only computer science class that made me cry. On to the next year. This is where things got pretty cool. Java was the first language I programmed my first platformer game in. And my second. Actually, I had a really bad habit of making half-finished platformer games now that I think of it. Anyways, Java is an object-oriented language. Objects in programming are instances of a class. A class is a combination of pieces of data stored in variables and functions that operate on those pieces of data. An object is an actual instance of a certain class. So you can think of a class as the definition or blueprint and the object as a real instance created from that definition. Classes are immensely powerful because you can use them to encapsulate complex functionality, but provide a clean, easy to use interface. After I learned about classes and basic data structures and algorithms in Java, I was ready to start on my first game. I wanted the game to have dynamic dialogue trees and branching storylines. So for that, I had to create a dialogue system and I used classes to represent different entities within that system. So year two is where I realized you can literally build the future with coding. This is the year I had my first summer programming job, working at a US national lab. At the lab, I built augmented reality apps for the Microsoft HoloLens headset. I built some apps that I probably can't talk about, I think. FBI, open up! But one project I could talk about is a holographic chicken chase game for the headset, which was an office favorite. If you are interested in building your own VR or AR apps, Unity is a great place to start. Most of the VR you'll see in my videos is just Unity and C Sharp. My third year is where I got into learning more advanced data structures and algorithms for internships. This is also where I fell in love with Python. After practicing programming puzzles in a dark room for a few months, this was the summer where I was able to somehow land a software engineer internship at Uber in San Francisco. If you didn't know, Uber ingests certain types of sensor data from your phone, such as accelerometer and gyroscope data. The safety team, which I was on, trained a machine learning model on features from this data 
that could predict whether or not a rider had been in a car crash. If Uber verifies that there had been an accident, the rider will be prompted by the app to call 911. My job was to see if we could reduce the latency on the results of the model by running prediction on the phone itself. Before this internship, I had very basic prior machine learning experience, so this was a real trial by fire, but it was one of my favorite projects because this was the first time that I was writing code that could potentially save lives. The AI part of the crash detection system used a neural network as the model. Imagine a neural network as a black box, which takes one or more inputs, like the sensors on your phone, and creates outputs, like whether or not you been in a crash. Neural networks consist of many small units called neurons. These neurons are grouped into several layers. Units of one layer interact with the neurons of the next through weighted connections. These weights are just real valued numbers. A neuron takes the value of its prior connected neuron and multiplies it with the connection's weight. The sum of all connected neurons and the neuron's bias value is then put into a activation function, which simply mathematically transforms the value where it can be passed onto the next neuron. In this way, the inputs are propagated throughout the network. Congrats, you now know what a neural network is. The real deal behind neural networks is to find the right weights to get the right results. The so-called training process, which is a more mathy topic for another video. And I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I actually spent five years in college learning CS, but I want to save my last year for the next video. Do not forget to subscribe to not miss out on any of those future videos.